is me, always. I'm not at the peak of anything or the culmination of anything. I'm not my experiences or my memories or anything leading up to this point. I just am. I've just always been here. I've always been me. The lie I told myself growing up was that there would be a point at which I would feel fully cooked. <laughs> Sorry, I guess dinner's ready. In the wilderness, there is no space for heroes. There's just whatever needs to be done in the service of survival, your own or your groups. And the selfish soul of the wilderness means that anything beyond that makes you the bad guy. As a teenage girl, it seems reasonable that you have a right to be upset about your best friend boinking and then getting pregnant with your boyfriend's baby. Like, that's pretty gauche. I think we can all agree. But what does betrayal mean in a vast, hungry wilderness? How can you justify paying attention to that sordid interpersonal drama left over from your cushy suburban life when you're stranded and starving in a forest? When you're counting down the calories till you pass out? When your only hope is to stay awake, praying that your fellow survivors don't get hungry enough so it's reasonable enough that you should set aside all of these small conflicts in service of surviving. But what happens when your broken husk is finally plucked out of the untamed wilderness that had claimed you, and everyone claps you on the back and tells you you're saved? This is everything that you'd hoped for. Back when you were curling your toes at night to stave off frostbite. Back when you were wondering when your next meal was coming if your next meal was coming. You can go back to the luxury of caring about those silly little things that come between friends who aren't lulled into peace by the collective growling of their sunken, hungry bellies. You can do that now. It's safe to indulge them because everyone tells you, Yellow Jackets, you're saved. Congratulations, you made it out of the forest. That's what they say. So you do it. You pull out every last stop and you perform anything to prove them right to prove that you made it out of the wilderness. But you didn't, did you? So what do you think really happened out there? Yellow Jackets tells the story of a high school soccer team, the Yellow Jackets, that crash land on their way to nationals and become stranded in the Canadian wilderness for a year and a half. The story pivots between the girls' fight for survival back in 1996 and their life today, 25 years later. In the present day, we are introduced to four of the surviving Yellow Jackets, Shauna, Thaisa, Nat, and Misty. These women have all come to cope with their trauma with varying degrees of success, but one thing is for certain, none of them are really doing great. The surviving Yellow Jackets have maintained to the public that they are not in contact, but they have kept a pact of silence for the last 25 years. Of course, their reticence to speak on how exactly they managed to survive their ordeal only further stokes the public's interest in this juicy story. First we meet Shauna. Shauna is a listless housewife married to Jeff her best friend's former high school sweetheart. Jeff is dating Jackie, the Yellow Jacket's captain and Shauna's best friend at the time that the plane crash landed. Shauna's coping mechanism is to forcefully insist that she's doing just fine. She's fine. She's fine. She copes by throwing herself into her family, but has come to resent this simpering, sorry housewife everyone sees her as. We first meet Shauna when she's dodging a reporter, and interestingly enough, in spite of this so-called pact of silence, she immediately reaches out to another surviving Yellow Jacket to warn her. Taisa. Taisa, an outwardly together go-getter with a wife and son, is running a campaign for state senate. As the campaign for state senate intensifies, so does the pressure on Taisa and her family, and the cracks in her perfect facade begin to show. Nat, in and out of rehab, but finally making a strong go of it, exits her most recent stint in a rehabilitation facility to go find Travis. Travis had crash landed with the Yellow Jackets because he was the coach's son. While we never meet adult Travis, his shadow looms large over the plot of Yellow Jackets. Nat is a single-minded lone wolf, and she asserts that she likes it that way. Last but not least, we meet Misty, who is also a lone wolf in her own way, but not by choice. In fact, Misty is a woman desperate to avoid loneliness at all costs. Her desire to be wanted, needed, loved is all-consuming, and each rejection only further cements her willingness to manipulate, control, and lie to those around her to get it. 
Ultimately, the series kicks off when the reporters nosing around in their personal lives coincides with a blackmailer who's sending mysterious postcards containing a symbol that only Yellow Jackets or anyone in that wilderness would recognize, suggesting that maybe we haven't met all of the survivors. And just like that, the Yellow Jackets are forced to band together for survival. Again. Shauna's relationship with Jeff is the closest any of the Yellow Jackets come to a best-case scenario after their trauma in the wilderness. Through Shauna's perspective throughout the series, we see Jeff as a traitorous, selfish cad and are led to believe he really doesn't care that much for his family. But in Shauna's Darkest Hour, it's revealed that the Jeff we had come to know was entirely a construct of Shauna's continued disassociation with reality and her unwillingness to deal with her trauma. Jeff was always acting in Shauna's best interest. Though his execution was, to put it mildly, not always awesome. It was still what Shauna needed and wanted all along. A partner. Someone that was there 100% behind her. Divorced from the context of the wilderness Shauna still inhabits in her mind, it's easy to cast a critical light on Jeff's actions, especially the blackmailing. But it's important to remember that Shauna and Jeff's communication problems are not his to bear alone. In fact, both Shauna and Jeff implicitly acknowledge that it is Shauna's trust issues that have driven a wedge between them and have made proper communication a non-starter. Shauna just can't see Jeff for who he is because she hasn't been able to see past the trees. When the entirety of your power is derived from the cushy social constructs only made possible by the safety of suburbia, you might end up spiraling like Jackie does in the series. When fear and uncertainty hit, you can feel in control of your circumstances by doing productive things. Or you can feel in control in more destructive ways. Of course, the petty interpersonal dramas that Jackie just will not let go can and do wreak havoc on the group. But in dire straits, when hunger has come a-knockin' and is now breaking down your door, the people around you will always choose survival, even if it means choosing survival over you. Whereas their stranding illuminates how petty and inconsequential most of these little arguments between friends really are to the likes of Shauna, who finds Jackie's tantrums distracting and unhelpful like the rest of the group, Jackie actually reaches a different conclusion about these little things, wherein the drama is actually quite consequential to her continued survival. She perceives conflict with others as confirmation that there is no camaraderie worth having in the wilderness, and in fact no one can be trusted to act justly save for herself. A friendship doesn't matter. Love doesn't matter. They're just things that we use to pretend we aren't going to end up like dead cabin guy, like rotted out husks in some bullshit attic. But of course, that's how it ends. That's all we are the whole time. It doesn't matter. We're just shells with nothing inside. Jackie does not see the futility of her continued search for vengeance because Jackie doesn't see it as any more futile than their continued fight for survival. That's probably because up until her ultimate comeuppance, she really hadn't experienced the true power of the forest up until that point like many of her comrades had. Jackie understands the surface level horror of their shared experience, sure, but largely you get the sense that Jackie kind of views this whole ordeal as a brief intermission in the ongoing movie of her life. That this is just an inconvenient side quest that she is impatient to get over with. Jackie's existing self-centeredness only gets more pronounced in the forest because every action feels as though her future happiness is on the line. Interestingly, I did not say survival because Jackie doesn't really perceive her survival at risk. She sees her future at risk. It never really crosses her mind as a true possibility that she might actually end in the wilderness. She acknowledges it, but she doesn't internalize it. Jackie just hadn't experienced the power of the forest to inspire those caught in it to restore order in a group at any cost. What, like the fucking spirits give a shit that Nat called dibs on Travis? This has nothing to do with her. Hey, what happened? Psycho, don't you understand? You don't matter anymore. What? Hey! Misty wasn't made in the wilderness. Misty was made to be in the wilderness. Her incredible and unexpected utility after their crash landing levels the playing field for the first time between herself and her soccer-playing superstar peers. 
She was the coach's assistant before they crash landed, so she was never quite in the same social circle or considered part of the team until the crash landing. It's this realization that her utility gives her unparalleled social leverage in this context that spurs her on to seal her demise and that of her peers. There's no reason for adolescent Misty to believe that sabotaging their only means of rescue won't yield the best results for her relationships with these girls. After all, she already knows the treatment that awaits her in their cushy suburban life that they left behind, being sneered at, ignored, if she's even acknowledged at all. And then suddenly she's thrust center stage as the only one that can save them all. Misty is so tragic because she knows as well as we do watching her that best case scenario for Misty is in the wilderness. I mean, in cushy suburbia, she's destined to be a lonely weirdo. At least in the wilderness, she's a lonely weirdo that's needed. While all of the Yellow Jackets suffered desperate loneliness as a result of their crash landing, Misty had already been living that back in their cushy suburban life. Therefore, prolonging their stint in the woods, making her comrades feel trauma-bonded to her, perhaps even trapped by that trauma, these are all rational calculations for Misty to be making. Because the alternative is unbearable. It is abject loneliness. In the deepest, darkest sense of the word. And after all, if we all learned one thing from the forest, it's that all we have is each other. Right? As long as you listen to me and do exactly what I say, okay? The various opiates of the forest become increasingly harder to resist as their plight becomes more and more dire. More importantly, these opiates and distractions become progressively harder to untangle from the act of surviving itself in the small sliver of comfort they provide the girls. Sex, drugs, and religion come into play all in varying degrees, and it's clear that some of the Yellow Jackets are more susceptible to their charms than others. But sex and drugs burn bright and fast, and they each have their own risks. And just as soon as the dopamine rush is here, it's gone again. And left in its wake is the gentle, cloying touch of faith. It takes shape in soft hands, sweet words, and a sense of purpose a sliver of hope to gnaw on in the hungry darkness. So religion, before you even understand what's happening, becomes integral to your continued survival as a group. Hell, maybe you don't even believe in it that much, but you're so fucking hungry. What's the point of fighting? You can just pretend. It's worth it to keep the peace, right? Right? You didn't say it. If Jackie were truly conciliatory, she would have said the prayer, right? Jackie didn't say it. If Jackie truly gave a fuck, she would have sat down and ate her damn dinner and said the fucking prayer. Lot? Let's join him. The honest truth is that you don't get out of the wilderness through someone else's virtue. By getting everything you thought you wanted, by acting the part, and hoping everything will just fall into place if you wish and act hard enough. The ultimate tragedy of the Yellow Jackets is not that their plane crash landed, it's that they weren't actually rescued. Not really. Not in the ways that matter. Think about the ruthlessness with which these women conduct their lives and speak about this pact of silence that they've held with the other women for the last 25 years. A lie. Just one of many lies that they tell the world and each other. All four of the surviving Yellow Jackets endanger one another by creating hurdles and sometimes even fatal obstacles just because they do not communicate properly. Each woman is guilty of withholding information that could solve another woman's predicament. But when the women come together, we can see that they're comforted by the other's presence and even emboldened by it. It's clear that they have a special loyalty to one another, 
a type of bond that is irreplicable in relationships untouched by this sort of trauma. But the flip side of that same coin is that they cannot be around one another without feeling instantly transported to the worst period of their lives. It seems natural then that they would want to stay clear of associating with one another if just to make it through a day without breaking down sobbing. But their shared unwillingness to open Pandora's box is their undoing. Because the problems plaguing them in 2021 stem from the tragedy in 1996, their unwillingness to talk about it means they can't get anything done. Instead, they pull out the playbook they've been using to get by in the world for the last 25 years. They start lying and manipulating one another as their primary tools of communicating. Not out of malice, but actually out of love. They want to protect each other from further pain and themselves. The first step to healing is by far the most brutal because it involves talking about it. But the surviving yellow jackets would rather die than risk opening up that wound. Even if there's a chance for salvation on the other side, Shauna, Misty, Thaisa, and Nat know that there is hell to pay to get there. Any one of the surviving yellow jackets could take it upon themselves to rip off the band-aid and start the process of healing by just telling the truth, not even necessarily to the press or the public, but to their other yellow jackets. But that's so easy for me to say. I'm looking from the top down. I get to see both worlds. And these women are still trying to see through the trees. If you take one nugget of wisdom from the Yellow Jacket story, please let it be this. There is only one way out of the wilderness, and it's alone. Even though the whole point is to prove that we have each other, that all we have is each other, and all we have is love, the wilderness teaches us that there is only one alternative to these things, and it teaches us the hard way. You can't brute force or rationalize your way out of the wilderness, and you can't take anyone with you. But on the other side, on the other side, you can choose other people. You can choose love, but the wilderness is integral to that. It shows us why we have to choose each other, why we always have to choose other people, and why we always have to choose love. The wilderness teaches us what happens when we choose wrong.